Hello, this is Ed from PracticalNetworking.net. Welcome to the last video in the Axe Control List video series for Cisco IOS routers. This is video 8, where we'll be answering the question, where should you apply your Axis List? To talk through it, we're going to use this topology. This topology has three routers and one host connected to each of the routers. We're going to try and accomplish this task of preventing host C from speaking to host A. Now we just learned how to configure Axis List in the videos prior. So let's go ahead and configure an access list that's going to prevent traffic from host C. Now you'll notice this is a standard access list. We're going to talk about standard access list first, and I'll talk about extended access list later on in the video. This numbered standard access list is configured to deny traffic with a source IP address of 10.33.33. That's host C's IP address. The next line is meant to permit all remaining traffic. Now this is important because we only want to prevent host C from speaking to host A, and we don't want to inadvertently prevent host C from speaking to host B or the internet. Now we learned from prior videos that you can apply access list to any router interface. In videos one and video seven, we talked through how you can apply an access list once per interface, per direction, or per protocol. To accomplish this goal, we can apply this access list to any router interface on the path between host C and host A. So if we map out the path, this is what it would look like, which gives us six locations we can apply this access list. But only one of those locations is the best place to apply it. And that's what we're going to talk through together. Starting with applying the access list to router 3's interface right here, filtering traffic coming in. So if that access list is applied there, let's see if it's going to prevent host C from speaking to host A. When host C shoots off a packet, it's going to have a source IP address of 10.33.33, which means it'll match that line, which means it'll be denied. So we have successfully accomplished this goal. But you have to consider what else host C might be trying to talk to. For example, host B. Well, the path for traffic from host C to host B is still passing through this access list. And since it's still going to have a source IP address of 10.33.33, it's still going to match that first line and be denied. So if we apply that access list right there, we are inadvertently preventing host C from speaking to host B. It'll be the same case for the internet. If host C shoots a packet to the internet, that traffic is gonna follow that path. And you'll notice it'll still cross our access list, which is configured to block any traffic with a source IP address of host C. Which means if the ACL is applied here, host C is also prevented from speaking to the internet. So it's great that we were able to accomplish that goal, but here you'll notice we have blocked more traffic than we meant to, which means this is not the best place for our access list. So let's move the access list to the next router interface in the path. Now we've moved it to router 3, filtering traffic out. Well, just like before, the path for host C to speak to host B, host A, and the internet is still crossing that access list, which means that access list is still going to successfully prevent host C from speaking to host A, but also inadvertently prevent host C from speaking to host B, and prevent host C from speaking to the internet. If we move it to the next router interface in the path, since the path for a host C to speak to any of these resources is still crossing our access list, we're gonna end up with the exact same result. Host C cannot speak to host A, which is good, but host C is also unable to speak to host B or the internet, which is bad. So we've identified that here, here, or here is not the best place for our access list. So again, let's move the access list to the next router interface in the path between host C and host A. And here, you'll notice something a little different will occur. Notice now, the traffic from host C to host A is still in the path, so we are still able to successfully filter that traffic. But now, the traffic from host C to host B is no longer touching that access list, which means host C is now finally able to speak to host B. So we've made some progress, but we're still not done because the path for traffic from host C to the internet is still crossing our access list and therefore still inadvertently being prevented. So let's again try the next router interface in the path. You'll see that if we apply the access list to router one's interface direction in, it's gonna be the same effect as we had it over here. Traffic from host C to host A is successfully being prevented. Traffic from host C to host B is successfully not being prevented, but traffic from host C to the internet is inadvertently being prevented. Which finally brings us to the last interface in the path. If we apply 
this access list to this interface direction out, you'll notice that the only traffic whose path goes through that access list is the traffic from host C to host A, which means we are successfully preventing host C from speaking to host A and successfully not getting in the way of host C speaking to host B or host C speaking to the internet. So we finally found the perfect place to apply that access list. Which means we can learn from this that when you have a standard access list, the best place to apply it is closest to the destination. Notice our goal was to filter traffic from host C to host A, which means host A was the destination. And the best place to apply that access list was as close as possible to host A. This way, it didn't inadvertently block more traffic than we meant to. So that takes care of explaining standard access list. But what about extended access list? Well, let's reconfigure our access list as an extended access list and step through the same process. Our numbered extended access list is granularly filtering traffic with the source IP address of host C and a destination IP address of host A. And just like before, we still have six different places we can apply that access list. So again, let's step through each of those locations and try and answer these three questions. Starting with this location right here, direction in on router three. You'll notice the topology hasn't changed, which means the path for host C to speak to all these resources is the same. And if we apply that access list right here, each of those paths is going through our access list. But since now we are using an extended access list, this deny statement is only gonna match specifically when host C is speaking to host A. Which means if we've applied the ACL right here, host C is indeed prevented from speaking to host A, but the traffic from host C to host B is gonna have a different destination IP address. That's gonna have a source of 10.33.33 and a destination of 10.22.22, so it's not gonna match that line. It will instead match our permit IP any any. Which means even though that traffic is going through our access list, it is being allowed through. And it's the same for the internet. Host C is able to send traffic to the internet because whatever it sends to the internet is gonna have a destination IP address of whatever our internet host is and not host A's IP address. So on the first place we've tried to apply our extended access list, we have successfully accomplished our goal. For the sake of thoroughness, let's go ahead and try the next location. Well, again, even though the path for all these hosts is passing through our access list, since our extended access list is granular, it's only going to get in the way of traffic between host C and host A, which is exactly what our goal was. You'll find that no matter where we apply the extended access list, in all cases, we have successfully accomplished our goal and not affected any more traffic than we meant to. That's the beauty of extended access list. Because they can be more granularly written, you can actually apply an extended access list anywhere you want. And as long as you write your access as specific as possible, you won't accidentally filter more traffic than you mean to. Now there's a general best practice that suggests you should drop packets as early as possible. The idea there is if you know you're simply dropping packets from host C to host A, you might as well drop them right here to prevent these routers from processing unnecessary packets, which creates this rule of thumb for extended access lists that you should apply them closest to the source. This allows you to drop them as early as possible to prevent your network devices from processing traffic unnecessarily. So we answered the question, where should you apply your access list? We learned that standard access list should be applied closest to the destination and extended access list should be applied closest to the source. And if you're studying for a certification exam, this is what you should memorize. That said, I wanna give you my personal recommendation for the real world. In the real world, I would recommend avoid standard access list entirely. Extended access list can do everything that a standard access list can, but you get the added benefit of the option to be more granular when necessary. So you might as well get used to using the better tool. And then you should apply those extended access lists wherever it makes sense. The idea there is to consider aggregation points. If this is your topology, then sure, applying an extended access right here makes sense. But if your topology is a little bit different, and now you're trying to prevent host C and possibly other hosts hanging off R3 and R4, to speak to host A, then maybe the best place for your extended access list would be right here or possibly right here. That's what I mean by consider aggregation points. Either way, that's it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the videos in the ACL series. If you did, the best way to thank me is to spread the word about this content. 
The more people who see these videos, the more it'll encourage me to keep continue making training videos for you. I greatly appreciate any sharing you can do. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Otherwise, thank you for watching this video, and we'll see you in the next one.